What's going on, family? It's your brother Lawrence here with another episode of Watch God Work. In every episode, we get the distinct pleasure and honor to speak to a brother and sister who's doing exceptional work in every field of human endeavor and business and civic leadership in all of the ways in which we have been called out into the world and they share their God story, the ways in which God has been at work in their lives and the ways in which God has been at work in their work. And today I have the distinct pleasure of speaking to our sister, my sister, I want to start there, but our sister, Jade Simmons. What's going on, sis? Lawrence, thank you so much for having me. I am so hyped for this conversation. <laughs> I, I am beyond hype. And th there, are, there are some moments, you know, we were talking offline, but there are moments where, you know, I, we do so much research <laughs> and I sit and I pray and I'm reading and I'm yeah. learning. And obviously, you know, when you come across figures who uh, are, their name precedes them, where you actually heard about them before, but you didn't necessarily know the story, th you, sometimes there's a feeling of overwhelm that I think wow. you almost feel when you start to read about all of the ways in which God is using them, <laughs> all of the ways they've touched <laughs> the world. And so as one who, as I say, I was one of those things where I was like, I wish my parents had me do the piano first. They, do, yeah. they did the, vi the violin, it was too late, right? <laughs> you know, and they tell you to do the piano first, right? Um, uh, I am so enamored but I think the world has come to know you um, as just this, hmm, I, in, a, in, a, in more words, there's a renaissance woman in the truest sense of the world, a, a, a creative who has been given the, the musical gift of being able to put her hands in the same way that God put his hands in our lives, put wow. a hand to plow and be able to create music, music like those that we, that you get, we get previewed in, in, in Revelation, but the music that has moved people music that often was often seen perhaps as not our own, but it was ours. And that mm. you have made reach and, 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 and touch so many ears and so many lives and so many experiences, global experiences around the world. People have come to know you in that regard, but people also come to know you as an amazing orator and speaker, where that ability to be able to motivate people with words has been something that you've come become to be known by. Uh, but also, and uh, there are many more things, but also someone who believes in the importance of public service and has been willing to raise their hand to find ways in which they could serve at, at, at scale um, in a time that I think we need uh, many, many leaders who put their hands down to serve others. But there's more than that. And because I can't embarrass myself <laughs> with the soliloquy of, of probably missing, leaving so many things out, the work she does with corporate companies, all of the things that she does, um, I'm so grateful to just have the, 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 the honor to be able to speak with you. And so, as we start in our tradition, who is Jade Simmons? Well, golly, I mean, <laughs> listen, I'm having a moment, Lawrence, because uh, we're going to talk about God's timing, right? And how, God's, how God works. But I'm having a moment because for years I've always said it doesn't matter if you know me before I got there, mm. it only matters that whatever I do is unforgettable before I leave. Mm. And your opening statement of saying that my name has preceded me, you don't know it, but it's prophetic because it's telling me I'm entering a new season mm. where the work now is being seen, where so much of what I was doing was beneath the surface. So mm. I just think you first of all for your obedience in your words and what you feel led to say you know you call that an introduction and for me it was confirmation so mm. thank you um who is jade man listen i made a pact with myself that there had to be a reinvention about every 18 months right mm. so the answer changes <laughs> every time i speak so let me just focus on what has stayed the same um i am a woman I am a woman of God, uh, a fierce follower of Christ. I am also a wife uh, to my husband, who was my original and only ever boyfriend, my high school sweetheart. We, we were 15 <laughs> years old, and I have no problem saying I'm 43 now. 
I'm a mother. Don't believe of, you, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mother, mother of two. Mm -hmm. Those things have been consistent or are now the consistent thing. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur, and I'm a big believer in the power of purpose. And I know now that my life's purpose is to unlock purpose, the discovery of it, and empower people to walk in it. That is my purpose, to cause people to be bolder, move bolder, and move bigger than they've ever uh, before. And a part of that is in emboldening their belief. So those are the core things. And I know throughout the conversation, we'll get into all the, the branches, right? But those are the things that exist that I don't think are going to change between now and the time I leave this earth. Mm. This is, you've touched on, I won't even call it a hornet's nest. That's no, always a negative thing. I think the conversation around purpose is yeah. a perennial one. Right. What is my purpose? What, what What is the meaning of my life? Why do I yeah. matter? Um, has been something that I think human beings have been asking themselves since the beginning of time. And yeah. I think in particular, there's been an old industry, um, so to speak, around purpose and finding purpose and the like. But uh, yeah. to the extent that one could be discerning and, and, and find real direction, I think that's really important. But two, there's something you said about every 18 months. And so this is what makes me want to now really get into the story of the beginning, because I, yeah. I think in, in, in some sense, there has to be someone who's comfortable with change, but also yeah. there has to be a, something behind why. why. Why must things change every 18 months? Why are those things? And so I'm, I'm, I'm in South Carolina in my head. I'm in Charleston. And I'm just thinking about the beginning with you in your early life. You know, what were some of the key moments, I think, growing up? What was the just the environment in your home? But also, where were some of the key moments that one pointed you to, God, I yeah. think you may be putting me on a path as, as as this gifted musician. But then also, God, I also want to be one who is just not comfortable being comfortable with doing one thing. Like, are there elements that early on, when you talk, yeah. you talk about your childhood, you, you, you see? Yeah, those elements were always there. Mm. But I understand society pushed upon me this idea that that idea of being multi-talented, multi-faceted, there was something wrong with that, that eventually I was going to have to choose, right? That's, mm. and if you don't, then you're flaky. That was just it. Uh, but I was that kid. I mean, typical American overscheduled kid, also coming from the generation of black parents who had uh, fought during civil rights. My father's civil rights activist, um, who's, my mom is an incredible Christian. She's the reason we believe the way that we do. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who had college, but for, so for their kids, it was a non, there was no discussion around whether or not you would go or not, right? It was just, which one would you go to? Um, overachieving parents equals uberachieving kids, <laughs> right? So I played five, six different instruments. I played all the sports. I was student body president, junior class president, sophomore class president, drum major, captain of the drum line. You know, I was that kid, right? <laughs> and my dad, I would bring home a new instrument. And he'd go, okay, here we go. Um, and I had an incredible band director that challenged us to learn multiple instruments, but I wasn't just in the marching band. I was in the youth symphony. So I played viola to your violin, Ooh. right? Uh, so while I was doing viola in the youth symphony, I'd won the concerto competition on the piano. Like that was the life. So we didn't work high school jobs because to my mom, right, working was what you did if you couldn't academically surpass a certain level. Mm. And even the husband that I married to, we didn't realize until we graduated many years later, we were tracked differently in high school. He got a different diploma that said, you're probably going to be a worker. Mm. So here are the courses you take, right? You lady are in the gifted and talented track. You have to go to college. Here are the courses. His parents never knew he was tracked. Mm. You understand? And so you come from this society where culture was already pre trying to predetermine what you did. Mm. I had parents who were ahead of the game. So I'll end by saying my mother understood and because of my father as well, he was of the mantra, you're going to have to run faster, jump higher. You know, that that's that's what I knew. She also understood that things were set up a certain way uh, to exclude. So she would tell me, Jade, when you hear the names of the top three classmates in your class called to the office, you go to. 
So when they would call out Kathy, Jennifer, and Alex, who I'm friends with, so I, but I can call their names, I went to the office too. I graduated number 12 in my class. I wasn't in the top five. When I heard those names, I went. They were being presented with opportunities for scholarships based on being ranked one, two, and three. Mm. I ended up with the most scholarships in the history of our high school because my mother told me to go when they were called. And I would search through that same pile. So, you know, I had this incredible advantage of parents who were woke before it was trendy, right? They were um, of the belief you can do whatever you feel called to do and we're going to help you do it. And so in that way, I feel like I had an abundance of riches growing up. And yes, the seeds of that multifaceted behavior were planted way back then. Mm. This is this is remarkable. I think one is always beautiful to hear the story of parents who believe, yeah. um, you know, who believe the best in their children and allow them to kind of flap their wings, obviously, but giving them a structure, a, a perspective on the world to say, yeah. you know, this excellence is important and you can explore that. Because you, I think the story of many of brothers and sisters may be that out of love, the way love was expressed by security, you need yeah. to do this, pick one do this and that's it and so have, being able to have the comfort to say explore what you want and do you know and and do that and explore that i think that's very very you know like it's just very important i, I i'm i'm curious you know with this right because i can imagine just the time right because when I, I hear people being you know so being able to to master and be mm -hmm. familiar with so many instruments I think of composers. I, I I think of Quincy Jones. I think of Prince. I think of yeah. I think of people who are able to play things. Was there was there a muse, or was it just curiosity? Hey, I like this and I like the sound because when people yeah. look later and get into and, and get into the music ensemble and boom shock and all the stuff you've done, it's like oh, she's always been about <laughs> yeah. bringing things together. But, but but what was your muse? Rhythm, mm. rhythm. Even in classical music, I tended to move towards the most rhythmic composers. So I played a lot of Russian music, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, these, and, and also dark minor keys. I just love that. I also loved horror movies growing up, right? So you, you can find all these little through threads in there, um, but rhythm is a, is a factor and it would come out and peek its head out, right? In drum line, mm. right? And then at Northwestern, I was in the drum line that I moonlighted in secret in that group of uh, boom shaka that we found yep, yep. you know, supposed to be practicing Chopin. We're off, you know, creating drum and dance pieces. Uh, rhythm would always come back. And it's why I don't believe we ever have detours as long as we're hearing and listening for the voice of God. Those detours were exactly what I was supposed to be doing. Right at the time, I was like, "Should I be? Could I be? Can I? Am I allowed to?" But I can look back now and understand. Even today, I help people find their own rhythm. Right, I help them create completely new drums. Don't just like create a drum and then march to the beat of it. But I, it's like God has these funny little hilarious hints <laughs> that He drops along the way. Rhythm uh, was the through thread. Um, and even today, my concerts go from Rachmaninoff to rap, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that, that rhythm again and the, the combination of, of adding speech there. So uh, my father introduced me to African drumming at a very early age. And I see now, you know, that always stuck with me. I, I'm, I think I'm going to hold this on the hand because I think there's, there's, there's a path that we're going to go down around just, just the musical evolution, your creative yeah. as, as an artist in, in the fullest sense. But this is also this piece around you, Rachel. God, you speak to your mother being such a profound influence um, around helping to cultivate the conditions of faith yeah. to be to to, to 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 take root in your home. But but what's often said though for many people when you have such a strong influence that is that there are almost like these what I would call step phases of okay, this is my house environment. This was my foundation, right? This is what I knew. But then I had when I left. I, there, there had, there was another yep. phase of when it really became my own, where I really was like, Ugh, sure. right. And it's not always the case, right? Some people really yeah. experienced that early on, but what was that for you? When was that moment when it really became like, okay, God, yeah. I, okay, beyond, I, beyond just knowing of you intellectually, right? And in the experiences, this is really mine beyond the, the culture and the, the being raised on, uh, upon, uh, according to the Lord in my home. 
Yeah, I am. Um, you know, my my parents growing up in the time they did uh, were also hippies, and mm. so I saw a lot of stuff when I when I was little. And <laughs> I remember my mom, who grew up in church, grew up in church. She has that story. I grew up in church, right? Parents big in church, and I went off and did my own thing. And she tells this remarkable story of being high and looking in a mirror. And she said, I felt like I was on top of the world. She said, I felt like I had a million bucks. She said, I felt unstoppable. And she said, I happened to come across a mirror and I saw that I looked like none of the ways that I felt. Mm -hmm. And that was her big wake up call that I'm being lied to. I'm lying to myself that I feel this way. And I'm looking in the mirror and I see the exact opposite. I see someone aging prematurely. I have no money in the bank. So I, I can feel like I got a million, but I'm actually broke. Right. Mm -hmm. So she has this incredible conversion story. And then she goes to this old time church and gets a good old school dose of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. speaks in tongues, all this stuff. I don't get I don't have that story. Right. Mm -hmm. Because she had such a radical conversion. She was determined that we would grow up not in religion, which is what she'd grown up, mm. but that we would grow up understanding relationship. Mm. And then you couple that with, I had an incredible um, uh, youth pastor and pastor growing up in Charleston, and they harped on relationship. They were asking us as teenagers, what have you heard from God this week? Mm. Yes, Jake, I hear you saying you want to go to that college, but is that where God wants you to go? And it was like, hold on, this is what I want. And so there was an understanding even then that if you seek God first, that's how you get your prayers answered because you're now praying for what he wants for you mm. versus praying for your own desires. So I, I had that again, abundance of riches, but I would say about 14 or 15, I became enamored with the word of God. Mm. And I started reading the Bible through for myself uh, early teenage years and in college, very uh, just in love with Old Testament in particular, um, and then very curious about who Jesus, uh, the man was on earth. Um, and I just, so I was very curious early on, but I will say I was sheltered in an incredible um, environment that prioritized relationship with God, hearing from him, um, I, I remember prophesying as a young girl in my church that I would mm. go up to them and prophesy. And some of this is just coming back now, Lawrence, for the first time, but I remember those things. And I also remember being prophesied over at a very early age. Mm. Uh, so I really was, was blessed in the way that I got to experience God firsthand very early. Mm. There is, it's, it's refreshing to me to just hear you speak about mm. it because i think it's like the hallowed be thy name that the awe of who god was to you at that time is even even as you speak now but it's also i think which is i think instructive for many people hearing this and seeing this is that i i think for many um you know for many people you know who are parents i think yeah. there's this there, there is this dance that i think those who are not parents will don't understand until they become parents which is yeah. you know i want the best for my child i i want to learn from the right things that i that i that i receive but i also want to build from the things that are maybe opportunities to grow and i think when it comes to faith often you'll see people on the other side not even saying it came from a bad experience it'll just be like <laughs> oh i want my kids to explore i want to this but it's like you know beyond the command to raise up your children in the fear and reverence of the Lord. I think there is something beautiful about who you became and who you were becoming at that age because it was so intentional to say, hey, we want you to have relationship. And just the fact that you were able to flourish and have a desire for the word and, and still be open in your life, right? Around the things that you, it, it, that's, a, that's a, it just, I think, encouraging for me to hear, but I think it's encouraging for other people to hear who are just trying to figure out how to do it in the that's best good. way possible. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I think when it comes to gifting, you know, especially if you kind of have had musical influence, there, there has to be almost again, a step function of when you realize that, okay, this is just not something I'm enjoying <laughs> yeah. and that I do well, right. Just like academically I do well, but this is different. This like is different. God, yeah. this is like the, the, to the ends of the earth type yeah. of dynamic that you want this ago, when, when was a moment when you recognize that God is saying, you, this is going to take you around the world. This is different for yeah. you. When was that moment when you sent, okay, this is something else? 
I think that probably came in middle school. Um, you know, with all the things that I did, and my parents were definitely very accepting and encouraging. The caveat was, if you start slacking in one area, that's a good sign that we need to put that down. Mm. I want you to have these multiple things, but you've got to commit to some level of excellence, mm. right? So the phone went to the wayside. Um, uh, clarinet was still at the top. I was able to maintain top chairs in that. Viola was still at the top. Um, but even eventually, once it came time to decide what I was going to do in college, I had to choose, mm. right? So it's not that choosing is wrong. And I'd, I'd had this broad foundation, but I began to narrow based on passion and excellence. And the piano, you didn't have to make me practice the piano. Classical music, I just got it. Before anybody taught me what a crescendo was, I did that naturally, mm. right? One told me, oh, this is the emotional shading. No one had to tell me that. I just felt it. And especially with anything from Chopin onward. And as a little girl, I would play very emotionally. And I remember playing a concert, playing in like a kid's recital. And this woman who probably was in her 50s or 60s at the time came over and said, she had tears in her eyes. She said, I don't know how to explain it. She said, but what I'm feeling, she said, I just, I've never felt this. And she showed me the goosebumps. And I remember thinking, this is just Chopin. <laughs> but I would go somewhere, right? Me and Chopin would go somewhere while I was playing, and as a 12-year-old, 11-year-old, 13-year-old, apparently the way that I was feeling the music was was otherly, right? Was remarkable. To me, it was just, I couldn't understand how people sat still and played Rachmaninoff. Like, you don't sway that, you're not, how? You know, and so some of my greatest critiques were she moves too much, right? It's too much emotion. And I just, I couldn't understand it. But I knew there was some ability I had to sit down and play and cause people to feel something. And mm. that, ooh, that was, I mean, it's like superpower. It was a superpower. And I discovered that very early and it became a calling card. Um, it also became, I think, how I compensated, right? If, if my etude wasn't as clean as everybody's, it was definitely way more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, and and that's, that has, you know, double-edged sword there. Um, but the emotion never was hard for me. Mm. Um, the perfection was, the perfection was strangling, mm. but the emotion was, was natural. Mm. The, the, mm. I, I love this. <laughs> I just love these stories, man. I, I know I got to. I know, I know. I'm, I'm preparing myself accordingly, you know, <laughs> but th th there's, there's a, there's a part of this I have to ask because I, I, I think what I call like big break moments, right? So I think you, <laughs> there, you, to your point, your sense that this was different, my, your ability uh, that, that God's ability through you to be able to touch people and to move people and to make people feel something was like, all right, clearly I'm on the right path. So let's assume that, yeah. all right, you're on the right instrument of, of the path of life. But I call like, it's almost like the violin, viola, the vibrato, right? You know, it's like, it. you know, the That's vibrato. It. When did the vibrato moments of like your life where it's just like, all right, God, this was the break where I'm clearly on the right instrument. I'm on the right note. Yeah. But now God's like saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to accelerate your that's career. A good, that's, the word. that's the word I would use. Um, so what I teach people in, in coaching is that what you're developing is the, is discernment. Mm. Um, but for those who don't, you know, speak the lingo, right? What it is, is it's an awareness of which doors are opening and which ones are closing, which ones to walk to through at which time. Mm. And that if you're really aware, you'll start to see the signs. So if I look back now, Everything I did when I focused on piano happened before it was supposed to. So whatever competitions I won, I won because uh, I won a year earlier than I was supposed to. Wasn't even supposed to be in it. It was only for ages 12 to 15, and I slipped in at 10 or 11, mm -hmm. right? When I went off to Brevard Music College, they accepted me a year earlier than they accepted most kids. And I never called home. They were worried I'd be too young emotionally, and my parents were like, she's not even calling home, right? <laughs> When I went, uh, almost every camp and academy, I was accepted early. Um, and so there was, I'm looking, there were these kind of like opening doors that were opening ahead of time. So those were clues, right, to me and my parents. This is something. She, she keeps winning. She keeps uh, getting in early. Uh, and then when I got into college, we had three colleges on the line. And my mom 
jumped in as the role of um almost like a football NFL agent, right? <laughs> okay, Indiana says they can do this, right? Northwestern, what are you going to do? And she played them all against each other. We ended up getting an incredible scholarship to Northwestern. Um, and I, Lawrence, I'm not supposed to say this, I'm sure, but I, I don't think I can get in trouble for it anymore, statute of limitations. But when I was an intern working in like work, work like work, you know, you do work study. Yeah. I was working in the admissions office and I saw my file. I saw my file. And you're not supposed to ever see mm-hmm. like your file. And my file had a sticky note on it. Um, and the truth was I had done well on SATs, well on ACT, but I wasn't the highest, highest. And that form said, forget the scores. We need her at this university. The campus needs her. What? Right? And, and my scores were, were good. But it's like, you know, when you sit down in the lunchroom for the first day at your big school and you realize you were a bit of a big fish and y'all are comparing SAT scores and you're like, oh, I'm not going to comment on that one because I'm not as surprised. <laughs> Right. Um, but those were a lot of breakthrough moments. God would send me confirmation that I was in the right place. Mm. Where did I want to go to school, though? I wanted to go to Juilliard. You see, it's the one school I didn't get into. Mm. So um, I understood early on that these detours were happening. Things that I thought were detours are really exactly where I was supposed to be. Uh, so we talk about these successes, but I have a long line much longer line of almost, Mm. right? I almost won Miss America, Mm. right? I almost got into Juilliard. Mm. I almost, I have a lot of those almost that those aren't the things you advertise on social media. Mm. Um, But the almost were what really put me (laughs) on the path of where I was supposed to be. Mm. You don't feel that way always in the moment, but because of it, now I celebrate the rejections. Mm. I celebrate them. When I get a no, Thank you, God, for closing the wrong door. I thank you that I will not have to suffer the des- the desperate devastation of the wrong yes. Mm. Thank you for opening the right doors, closing all the wrong ones, and putting me on the path that you have me on. I believe rejection is divine protection, protecting us from the devastation of the wrong yes. Mm. And when you get that, you celebrate the, the, the radio silences, the no callbacks, the job losses, because you understand that what you're doing is so important. God can't afford you just to feel good because you're where you wanted to be when it's not where he has you planned to be. That changes your life, changes your life. The divine <laughs> devastation. Y'all, I yeah, want to say the, it. Dev- the yes. divine yeah. devastation of the wrong yes. Yeah, Book that. The desperate de- it's divine protection, divine protection. That's what rejection is. And for a lot of the women that I coach, when they get that, oh my God, it's so freeing. Every relationship, right? When, when you were rejected, thank God that you got out when you were supposed to. Mm. Thank God that that job that knew it wasn't going to use you to your fullest potential said no now. So you don't have to waste any years squandering away in a space that's too small for you and not built for the size of your purpose. Celebrate that no, and then ask God, where is the yes? Align my feet with that. Help me walk on the pathway towards that. And even though a lot of my clients that come to me for coaching are also uh, followers of Christ, many of them aren't. Mm. But here's the thing. The spiritual principles work whether or not you believe in the God who created Mm. them. Fair or unfair, you got people who don't even step foot in the church, but they tithe and they are seeing (laughs) the benefits in their finances. The spiritual principles work. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The spiritual principles work. Mm. I I just feel like, you know, the mic need to cool (laughs) off a little bit for the chance to breathe. (laughs) Just just a little, just a tad bit, you know. (laughs) You know, uh, I, I did talk about the ends of the earth piece, though, um, and 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 I I don't, I don't limit that, right? There is the there is one what one could say, given the nature of classical music and the circuits per se, right? You know, beyond the 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 concert halls in the United States, one could say that the circuit is, you know, Euro- European. You're gonna be you're, you're gonna you're gonna have to leave the states. 
to do so. But I, I would challenge that a bit. And I, and, I, and I guess the question is, what gave you the global perspective? Right. You know, yeah. it, it, even in the style. Right. You know, from from from, you know, if you know that from the Tchaikovsky, the Rachmaninoff to, you know, what gave you the style range to be so global as well as just where yeah. you have been in your work? You know, what, what moment when you recognize, you know what, I want to take this everywhere in the world. Was it a faith part of it? Was it just those were the doors no. that were opening? No, I think it's important to make sure that I don't come off sounding more strategic than I was. Mm. All those amazing discoveries we have um, are in the midst of trial and you didn't intend them. And if you could have it your way, you would have done it your way, which was mm. not supposed to just be playing Chopin, Rachmaninoff, Beethoven, wash, rinse, repeat, New York Philharmonic, Beijing Philharmonic, period. I wasn't supposed to be wearing leather, shaving the head on the side, mohawk wrapping. None of that was the plan. So let me be real clear. Once I started performing and I played in all the smallest, there's a circuit that emerging artists do. We're in the backwoods and the smallest towns playing auditoriums that on weekends are where they play basketball. And then, right, when you're there, it's the concert hall. I played that circuit. I was the emerging artist. And I remember thinking, how come these emerging artists never emerge? They just always emerging artists and they disappear. <laughs> That's the question. Then there's a new question, emerging <laughs> artists. And I remember doing that and started asking for things. So I finally won this competition, had a manager. I was on my way, had my record deal. And I started pushing back, Lawrence. I noticed I was getting all these bookings in Black History Month. But somehow they would fall off in March, April, May, June. And I started saying, I no longer am playing in Black History Month. That's my vacation month. My music sounds just as good in March, April, or May, June, mm. July, August, September. And my managers were like, wait a minute, that's like the primary. So no, we have to push back on this or else we're always going to be the featured black artist in February and the emerging female artist in March. Mm. And so we push back on that. Um, I started changing things up a bit by speaking in my concerts. That was the changing point. Now, the only reason I was speaking, Lawrence, is because I was tired from spending the rest of the time proving myself by playing all the etudes, all the sonatas, sweating through my gowns. So I started talking to the audience to catch my breath. The stories became the story. Get that pianist who talks, because nobody else was talk talking in classical. We were all, you know, stiff upper lip, and it's all about the sacred composer. Let's talk about Liszt. Did you know he was a womanizer? This dude had women fainting. Let's talk about Mozart. And the audiences were like, I never knew that. So that became the thing. That took my classical career on a trajectory. And then there were other industries that I had heard I was, who's this girl who's speaking? So that started a corporate career in speaking. And I became the girl who plays the piano. So now you had Hershey saying, bring Jade in. Yamaha saying, we'll put the bill for the piano. Right. And so now I was an anomaly, not only in classical because of the speaking and I've begun blending genres, but I was, uh, you know, unique in the world of speaking because now I was bringing in the music. Um, and then, you know, you, you learn to start to go where you're appreciated. So some mm. will switch to corporate because her classical wasn't taking off. No, I was still playing. I was still making more money than a lot of my peers in classical who were still saying, I'll just play for the reception food. So I can't support a family playing for the reception food. Right, we need a check. Right? When I went to corporate, that's the first time I understood that your gift will make room for you, mm. but that it will put you in unexpected rooms. So suddenly, I'll just go ahead and say it: National Endowment for the Arts. Right, the, the those people are having conferences and want me to come speak for free, but Hershey's is saying we'll pay you five figures for forty-five minutes. huh, what's this? So the irony outside of music, they were honoring my gift of music. In the world of music, come on, come on. In the world of music, they didn't see the value. So there comes this time where you have to say, is it worth it to keep my original vision, which, which just to be a classical pianist, shut up and play? Or do I go now in this world that is allowing me not only to play, but to use my voice to make a direct instant impact? And so today it is humbling to understand that where I am now, some of the biggest corporations 
are bringing me in to inspire their people on purpose, right? And I'm playing the piano and at a time where it was hard to break into some of the concert halls. The irony, once I started making it in this other industry, suddenly the old industry starts calling again. Ooh. That'll preach, oh, there's, there's, right? There's a word. <laughs> That'll preach. Um, once you start to glow in purpose, people get the value and then the decision is on you, which opportunities further your purpose. You no longer make decisions just primarily on profit. And what I've noticed is that we've made purpose-based decisions as a company. Where will we speak? Which companies do we partner with? Uh, the profit follows that. You understand? And now when I want to play a concert, I don't have to have anyone book me. I book a concert hall, you see? And then I promote it and the community comes. I play whatever the heck I want to play. I don't have to answer to anybody. The critics can come if they want. They can write whatever they want. But what they write doesn't determine if I get another concert or not. Mm. You see? That's what it means by your gift, making room. If you're okay with going in unexpected rooms and doing unexpected things. <laughs> Jay, Jay, there, there were a couple messages in the piano. I know, piano. I'm not um, trying to room for myself. I, I, I know, seriously, I, I, the Jay, I was trying not to, because I was, I didn't want to put this in the frame. You know, I was like, here, like, let me grab this. Let me grab this at your, Jay, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be over here like, you know. Um, Jay, this, this, mm. I had, I, oh, time. I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. th th that is, that is so powerful. And like I said, that'll preach. Um, but that, that will, that will help people live a better, um, it's, and, it's... and, and, and I, I do think they're, you know, a drawing from the word of, uh, your, your gifts will make room for you. I think it is, it is so fitting the illustration that you gave. Yeah. I, this, this picture of purpose, like we talked about this mammoth of area, I am interested around then, was it the, was it the invitation to talk about it more of the impetus? And then you started to pull together some of the principles that just were yeah. endowed in you, right? Just when did the purpose part of it just become so clear? Oh man, that's a good question. The purpose part became clear when it became clear to me. So when I was on that stage in the early career years performing to impress audiences, and I thought my purpose was to play the piano, which meant that if that's my purpose, I gotta play it perfectly. I can't make any mistakes because my worth now is, is hooked up into this instrument. Mm. So you talk about a depression when you crash and burn in a concert, you think you are now worth nothing, right? Mm. God has saved me. I, I've never had any scathing reviews. I've either had no critic in the audience when I had my worst night, you know, or glowing critic when I was doing okay. Um, but what happened was when I started speaking and people were responding to the stories more than the etudes, which I had played darn well, I was originally offended. I'm like, you should be, did you hear how I was awesome? Did you not hear me tear it up? And they're like, oh my God, what you said, it just touched me. And I'm like, but did you hear me slay, right? And they were acknowledging something much deeper. And I understood that, oh, my purpose is not to play the piano. My purpose is what happens in others when I play, when I speak. So here's the, here's the thing that I say on every stage. Your purpose is not the thing you do. Your purpose is the thing that happens in others when you do what you do. Mm. At that point, I had chosen Lawrence. I had fixated on piano and I'm a, you know, uber excellence junkie. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to have the most. I'm going to be the best concert pianist. So my a fixation had set in. Understanding purpose freed me up again. Because now if purpose was what I did, is what happened in others, I can take my purpose and put it in different vehicles again. I can write a book as long as it caused you to be bolder and, and believe bigger. I can play the piano. I could speak as long as the same thing happened. I could minister, something I had been running from officially. Um, I could minister as long as my sermons, I don't know about Lawrence's sermons, I don't know about T.D. Jake's sermons, but my sermons had to activate you into becoming bigger, believing bigger, and moving in a bolder fashion. 
wrap it back up. That's where the reinvention happened because my purpose will start going, all right, we've been in this vehicle. We've sowed some seed. We've done what we're called to do. Where are we going next? It just so happened when I looked back about every 18 months, something new was presented. And when you find pattern, you then now have the mandate to understand the pattern and adopt it as system. So once I found that pattern, my adaptation and, and adoption was, okay, this must mean I am built to reinvent. You mm. said I'm a like change. I'm addicted to it. I'm addicted to it. What companies bring me in? The one who are having trouble with change. The one who are fearful that they won't be able to reiterate in their next season. So you see, you'll find these, once you find these things, it's like you cannot see it but then you must act on it and it becomes my blueprint. So then when I read about Lawrence and see what he's done, I can be in awe, like you said, of what God is doing versus being jealous and comparing myself to you because I can just go, Lawrence has found purpose. He knows where he's going. He's actually confirmation that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Hey, hey, <laughs> yo. You, did, did, uh, did, you know, uh, a, a fellow, a Houstonian, shout out to my brother, Terry Williams out of Houston. Um, he said something, uh, I think, profound, which I think has been said before, which is cling loosely to title, cling tightly to purpose. That's good. You know. <laughs> cling loosely to, to everything. To mm. everything. Not just title, but to role. Mm. You, my, I have a role as a mother. But now when you talk about timing, that means I have to sit down with my kids and say, listen, for the last six months, mommy's been in your face. We've been rolling around on the floor laughing, movie night every night at seven. But I feel a shift coming. And in this shift now, I have to focus on the next book that God has called me to write. That means I may not make family time every night at seven. I may not do this, but please let these last six months be the evidence that mommy loves you and nothing has changed. We don't give ourselves permission to shift. It's always your season. You just have to figure out what season you're in. It's mm. always your time. You just got to know what time it is. Mm. You so that thing about it's not my season, and that's a lie. You might be hibernating. You might be seed planting, but it's your season. But you can't just wait on harvest because you didn't plant any seeds, right? It's your time, but it's just 6 a.m. Showtime isn't until noon. How are you preparing from 6 a.m. to noon? You see, those, those principles have freed me and changed me and empowered me. And they take away the overwhelm and the anxiety that am I doing something wrong? Did I get this wrong? And I still have those moments, right? Well, God, I thought you said to do this. And so I'm always going back. Did I hear right? And he'll say, no, I got it. But you're on a different timeline. You're trying to fast forward. Remember, Jade, that's your nature. You run ahead. You fast forward but I'm trying to get you to move one day at a time. Like, oh, okay, God, I got it. I got it. Mm. And I can <laughs> see that. <laughs> you said something about running ahead because I want to honor your time in the, mm. in the time piece around this because we're going to have another conversation. I, I need to come down. We, we, you know, I'm going to go to, I'm like, I'm going to come down. I interview you somewhere. We got to do something. We got to do S and something. We got to figure something out. But um, running ahead, energy. Um, I think one of the burdens, I think of, uh, I think, an unhealthy relationship to work that many, I think, in this generation um, have is um, the rhythms. To your point, there's a different set of rhythms, the life rhythms, sustainable rhythms to build a career and build a life yeah. and to be able to have the energy to show up with excellence in, in, the, in the work of hands in one arena, but, in, but, but with faithfulness in, in the other arenas and pieces. You know, how, how, what is your ideal rhythm with God? How do you, given what God is calling of you in this season and then perhaps previous peak seasons of your career, mm. what was your rhythm with God tangibly that, that you connected that just most empowered you to do the work you're doing? Because it's high output work, travel, yeah. this, that, speak, this. What was your rhythm with God at that time? And what is it with God? What is your rhythm with God now? That, that last year was probably my highest intensity year. And I know we'll get to this in a, another conversation, but I ran for office last year, not, not just office, I ran for president. Mm -hmm. Yes, of the United States, not the PTA. I got that question mm -hmm. a lot. And talk about needing to have rhythm. Because of COVID, I was also homeschooling in the middle of that campaign. Mm -hmm. And 
And I have help. We have a, a nanny who works with us. We have housekeepers that come every three weeks or so. Uh, but even with COVID, a lot of that was was not what, what it was. And I had to have, people would think I probably was working the most ever last year. No, I was worshiping more than I ever had last year. Mm. I, when I tell you I would roll out of my bed onto my knees and say, God, I cannot, I cannot run a campaign and simultaneously run my business and homeschool and keep my family happy without you. I need you to guide every last thing. So the rhythm was worship took out, took up 30 to 40% of my time. Worship and word, and God never fails. Every worship session, I either felt a release or I got a download. Every time I was in the word, I got a release or a download, which made that then critical and addictive behavior. Um, and I was able to sometimes give a speech or do whatever I had to. Plus, I was having to digest a ton of new information, running for office, knowing foreign policy, all these different things. When it says that the Holy Spirit will teach you, I can say this now because the campaign is over. There was stuff that I would learn hours before an interview and be able to speak on it as an expert and then write policy on stuff I'd never done. So I think when you're in the most, the deepest waters and the most foreign territory, your appetite naturally goes up, should, uh, for having the presence of God in your life. Now I will say, I feel like I'm in slacker mode, right? I'm not doing the the big three hour long sessions. And I was feeling so guilty about it, Lawrence. Like, well, God, am I, have I backslidden? He was like, no. He said, we're gearing up. We're gearing up for the next thing. We're still connected. Mm. So now it's gentle little kind of conversations that we have. It's not that intense, <laughs> desperate worship session. And that's okay. I think the biggest thing we need to have is a, a release of condemnation. Mm. Say yes to addiction, which is important. But this is not, God's not seeing who spends the longest time on their knees. He is checking to see whose heart stays connected the most constantly. I saw one of your uh, interviews about how consistency, right, is, is kind of like the new, the new faith in a way. And that's what it is. Can we be consistent in just acknowledging that he's there? Um, and stays, that's been staying the same. Jay, Jay, this is, um, this is such a gift. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I am um, because of the rhythm that you're in, you know, I'm I'm, I'm honoring the time. <laughs> but like there's a part of me which is like, fam, I, I think we're, we're going to have to do another part. Um, yeah, we need to do part two. Do part two but I think there, there's a lot for people to d take in. But I think from all that they will take in, a lot will be released. Um, and I and I think I'm I'm grateful for that. I. I have to ask because when people see this, I think what naturally you, you kind of hinted at one piece of a book, you know, and you've written many, uh, you know, for you, what is ahead? How could people partner with you, co-labor, support what you have coming up in this next season? What, 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 what do people have to look forward to? Wow. You know, I've, I've only written and published uh, two, three, three publications. And what I have on my heart is a release of all the stuff we've been talking about to put it in written form. I feel yeah. like people are looking for blueprints um, and these little nuggets that we see already are unlocking so much in people's lives. So I first want people to be in prayer uh, with me about the right time to release the right information so that it's received powerfully. Um, and, and to really just stay connected. Um, of course, there's my website, jadesimmons.com, and I'm on... Uh, Instagram at official Jade Simmons. We want people to stay tuned because we believe that a lot of what we're going to release, people have been waiting for. Um, and you know that word support. It it that's that's a whole nother session because we learned what support really is last year, and we learned what it really yeah. is not. And so I think the way that people can support us now, I don't know if anybody else has said this on your show, is to do the work in themselves to be ready for whatever new thing God is doing. Mm. So when the new thing happens, they don't bat it away. They don't cling to whatever they're used to, but that they're ready to receive it. Oof. That is the support we want to see so that when we introduce what we believe is the new era um, for us as individuals, for us as a nation, people can at least hear it and entertain it uh, instead of blocking their ears in favor of what they're used to. Uh, 
eyes for all you know was seeing ears forever hearing you know we we know how the story ends um I, i'm hopeful and I, and I join you in faith and believing that there will be many will be ready to receive uh, when you believe it's time to release um, but i think even in this snippet i would say even of this short hour uh, of, of this conversation we've had I, I just I, there I just think this this there's this inspiration I think to just see things differently um and to see purpose in a real way I I, I really think just your ver your your words around purpose and reinvention it, <laughs> that needs to come now <laughs> you know so so so, so uh, but 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 we will be patient let, let, let us not be selfish so we will not be selfish but but Jay I, I just want to say thank you I, I I thank you for this time that you have given as a gift. Um, to to us, um, I always say that I'm always I'm I'm in the I'm in the first I'm in the first pew in these conversations of listening and taking everything in, but I, I think you know for such a time as this, this is the conversation that people need to have because I I think that there's so many people who have been gifted and have have been called to things, to do, right. and they've been so bounded by the frameworks that have been outdated and just do not apply, and purpose mm -hmm. is not always public purpose is to your point it is the effect it is the purpose that also manifests in, its, in your family your neighbors the pe purpose is consistent as such as his promises are to us and so i think for for you and your faithfulness for you being bold yourself and embodying that in the ways that you look to serve in the ways in which you play and for how we feel i thank you I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And I can't wait for our next conversation. I'm going to, no, I'm going to figure out a way. We're going to figure this thing out. So I, I can't wait for it. But Jay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless your family. God bless your children. Uh, God bless your mind, your spirit, and your relationship with God. I thank you that we're a beneficiary of it and more. Thank you for having me. Jay, I'm grateful. Take care.